What's up ladies and gentlemen, the Bishop is a minor long range piece that is worth 3 points according to many chess sources but it can be more useless in chess than you thought. In fact, you don't always need your bishops. If you wanna know why, stay tuned and make sure to hit the like button and subscribe if at all you haven't already. In this video, I present to you 8 little known facts about the Bishop in chess. Let's get started. Fact number 1. The Bishop is mostly used as a sacrificial lamp for positional sacrifices on f7 and f2, sacrificed for the common good. For example, you can sacrifice your bishop as early as move 4. You start with e4, black plays d6, the perk defense, and then you go bishop c4. You can see in the latest database the top played move is knight to f6. White normally defends the pawn on e4 with d3 and some even play queen f3, but you can also play the weird looking pawn to d4 move, which invites knight takes e4 by black. And this is when you can surprise your opponent right on move 4 by sacrificing your bishop on f7, bishop takes f7 check, so that after king takes, you go queen h5 check, provoking black to make a weakness on g6, then you go queen d5 check, and on the next move you are going to win the knight like this. For example, black may play bishop g7, then you go knight to f3 first, developing your knights before any other pieces is always advantageous. Watch this video that has popped up in the card above where I emphasized on this. Rook f8, then you go pawn to h4 immediately wanting to go h5. If pawn to h5, you have knight g5 check and on the next move, you're going to win the pawn on g6 which is not good for black. So this is one example of how you can use your bishop as a sacrificial lamp on f7 to slow down black's game. Another example is where you start with e4, then instead of d6, black starts with c5, it doesn't matter. But still you go knight to f3, they play d6, the modern variation, you go pawn to d4, all normal stuff, then they play knight f6, attacking your undefended pawn on e4. Again, you don't always have to defend this pawn, or you can still go bishop c4, inviting knight takes e4 immediately because that's what everybody plays, you can see. And that's when you go bishop takes f7 check, they have to take your bishop. And then you go queen h5 check, provoking a weakness once again on g6. Then you go queen d5 check and on the next move you are going to win the knight on e4. And surprisingly enough, the second most played move here is bishop e6 as you can see, which is just a free piece. So black doesn't have to play like this and here you are definitely winning the game. Anyways. Another example that I can show you where you can use your light squared bishop as a sacrificial lamp is in the king's pawn game e4 e5 then knight's opening where black has to protect his e5 pawn and then you go pawn to d4 the scotch game then bishop c4 and now black plays bishop c5 the move that you can consider playing here is pawn to c3 immediately at best you just want to take the free pawn on d4 and you're also sacrificing a second pawn by the way if black takes which is the top played move the easiest you can do is to go bishop takes f7 check again you can see this good position of sacrifice making black lose his right to castle after capturing the bishop and that's when you go queen d5 check and on the next move you don't even win black stack squad bishop immediately first of all you provoke this weakness that we've been talking about you can see these highlighted weaknesses in red after black plays pawn to g6 and that's when you take the dark squad bishop on the next move you can even align your pieces like this Black has a lot of weaknesses, you're going to cast a shot, this is simply winning for white. If you want to know how you can sacrifice your bishop on f2 with black pieces, you can watch this video that has popped up in the card above after watching this video. Let's move on. Fact number two, the bishop and knight are actually best friends. Yep, chess players usually value a bishop more than a knight because of its long reach. Yeah, like the bishop can move from one flank to another in just one move, rubbish. The truth is that it depends with the position and the stage of the game. Bishop and knight tend to work together very well in the opening stage. For example, you start with e4, black plays e5, then you open up with the bishop's opening. And then you can see the top played move is knight to f6. Then you ignore this attack and play knight to f3. Giving black one more chance to take your free pawn on e4. If you want, you can take back on e5 by the way. But consider playing knight c3 inviting black to accept your board and kids a risky gambit which is also known as the reverse Stafford Gambit. I like this Gambit because it gives black more chances to blunder. For example, there's only one correct move in this position, which is very weird, by the way. Pawn to f6 is the correct move. If black plays the top played move, pawn to d6, for example, 
this is the best example where the bishop and knight can be very deadly so you can see this good combination the bishop they're getting the f7 square and the knight also targeting the f7 square black cannot do anything here without losing material for example bishop e6 you just take and there's another threat on f7 or on b7 a more decent example to show you how the bishop and knight can work together very well in the opening stage is in the fried liver attack which arises from the two knights defense the position that you're seeing on the board right now where you can go knight g5 and now we see that the knight and the bishop are both targeting the weak f7 pawn so black has to play d5 but you can just take if they take back, well, you can even sack your knight on f7 like this because after black takes with his king, you will go queen f3 check. Note that black's knight is also pinned to the king by our light squad bishop. So if king e6, you go knight c3, putting more pressure on this pinned knight. The knight b4 is what everybody plays. The whole secret with the fried liver attack, you guys, is this pawn to d4 move. And the fact that black's king will be on the center for a longer period of time. So don't worry about the fact that you are down a piece. You are not mating anytime soon. Just go ahead and cast a shot. If c6, now you go pawn to d4. That's the secret. So that if queen f6, you don't trade queens, by the way, you are the one attacking. So you want to keep the queens on the board. So you go queen d1. If e takes d4, you have knight e4 attacking the queen and queen g6, you go pawn to a3. If they go knight a6, you go queen takes d4. Note that black has no game. His position is cramped. Fact number three, you don't always need a bishop pair in your life. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, they say two bishops are stronger than bishop and knight, but certain openings don't necessarily require you to have a bishop pair e.g the advanced Karukan defense the perk defense the french or let me just show you why it starts with e4 then you go pawn to c6 the Karukan defense they play d4 you go d5 and then you can see the top played move is pawn to e5 which is the top played move in both the leeches and the masters database the whole idea in the advanced Karukan is to develop your light squad bishop as quickly as you can moving it out of the pawn chain if knight f3 you go pawn to e6. The whole idea is to trade off your light squared bishop as quickly as you can. And that's when you switch to your French defense ideas with the immediate pawn to c5. They play c3. Now you go knight c6. Everything that you do in the French defense, by the way, you can go queen b6 if you want. But I like queen c7. If bishop e3, you simplify the game like this. And then you want to continue your development as highlighted. I don't want to spoil much. If you want to know more about the Karokan defense, get my Karokan course at www.kasperchess.com and it will be your favorite defense against pawn to e4. Anyways, another good opening where you don't always need your bishop pair is in the perk defense with pawn to d6. The whole idea is that after d4, a knight f6, normal variation, knight c3, the pawn to g6, and knight to f3. It's up to you to go for bishop g4 immediately and trade off your light squad bishop or continue normally with bishop g7 and wait for black to play the most played move bishop c4 after which you cast short and they cast short. Then even though you have an opportunity to take on e4 by the way, in case you didn't know because you are going to double attack white's knight and the light squad bishop, you can just go ahead and play bishop g4, get rid of your light squared bishop and then start playing chess like this. Ladies and gentlemen, this is considered to be favorable for black. For example, here you are attacking the d4 square. If bishop e3, you have pawn to e5 immediately. If they play d5, you can go knight e7 if you want, but even better knight d4 so that if bishop takes, you take back. And in most cases, why to find it very difficult to win back the pawn on d4 because you have so many options. For example, knight d7 is a good move because it paves way for your dark squared bishop as well. So you gave up your bishop pair and in the process, you forced black to give up his bishop pair as well. Anyways, other openings where the bishop pair is almost useless are openings like the stonewall attack, the Trompowski, the French defense, etc. Anyways, fact number four, two bishops are useless in closed positions. This is the simplest way to remember that bishops are better than knights only in open positions. So to use the bishop pair, you need to open up the position. Like in this case, you can see that white has two bishops, but 
They are almost useless. They can't do a thing. It is Black's two knights that can only make progress in this position. So knights are extremely good in closed positions. For example, white may play bishop f2. Then you can go king e8. I mean, the whole idea is that white doesn't have many sensible moves. Pawn to h4 is a good attempt, but black can just take. And after bishop takes h4. By the way, there is no need to memorize this. I'm just trying to make a point. You can go knight g6, a tactical move by the way. You want to plant your knight on f4 forever. If you think bishop takes f6, wins a pawn, well, that loses the bishop immediately. White's bishop is trapped. So this is how useless two bishops can be in closed positions. Here is a great London system example where two bishops can shine in an open position. You can see that this dark squared bishop has more squares that it's covering. Even the light squared bishop, it has more space and more squares to go to. Unlike black's two bishops, the light squared bishop is a bad bishop and equally black's dark squared bishop isn't active on e7. Another example, here we have two bishops in an open position that can even be more powerful than one rook and two pawns. E.g. in this position, it's white to play and win the rook in one move. Leave the answers in the comment section down below so that I can also learn of your existence. Let's go! If you want to successfully utilize your bishop pair, play openings that are more likely to lead to an open position. For example, the open ruler pairs, the Gyoko piano, the Italian opening, the scotch game, the four knights game, the two knights defense, the Evans gambit, king's gambit. For example, I like playing the deuce gambit, which starts with e4, then e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, then black plays the top plate move, bishop c5, I go castle short, inviting knight to f6 the top plate move and then i play pawn to d4 immediately the reason why i like the deuce gambit against black's gyoko piano is that at least it forces black to give up his bishop pair very early all of these moves highlighted in red for black are blunders and this line also opens up the position right in the opening stage so black has to take with the bishop anyways then i take back with my knight so on the other hand, if you don't like entertaining your opponent's bishop pair, you can play openings that are more likely to lead to a closed position, e.g. openings that are in the queen's gambit family, like the queen's gambit itself, slav defense, semi-slav queen's pawn game, or even the ready opening, the catalan, the czech benoni, the king's indian defense, etc. That's if you don't want to entertain your opponent's bishop pair. Anyways, fact number five. Bishops smile in open diagonals. You must open diagonals if you have an extra bishop. The position that we are looking at is from the deuce gambit which I showed you in the last chapter. Black just took our knight on d4 and then here I would love to open up the diagonals for my bishops for example beginning with pawn to f4 so they have to play pawn to d6 after which I take on e5 and after d takes e5, you can clearly see how open the diagonals are for my two bishops. I can play pawn to a3 on the next move. Let's move on. Fact number six, bishops and pawns of the same color are enemies, period. Do not place your pawns on the same color as your key bishop. This is mostly the case in openings like the advanced Karokan defense and the semi-slav or the slav defense. Let's say after white plays the top plate move, bishop g5 or pawn to e3, say bishop g5. You get rid of your light squared bishop after it takes f3. Since you no longer have a light squared bishop, you start controlling the light squares on the board with your pawns. This automatically satisfies the middle game principle that do not place your pawns on the same color as your key bishop. For example, we have a dark squared bishop here, so we don't need our pawns to be on dark squares. Bishops and pawns of the same color are enemies especially in the end game. Fact number seven, opposite colored bishops are much more drawish. The easiest endings to draw are those with bishops of opposite colors, ladies and gentlemen. This position can be a dead draw since your pawn on f7 is on a different color as your opponent's bishop. Here is how you can draw this game so easily. Just make sure that your king is just moving on light squares and also your bishop. For example, king g4, Let's say bishop d6, you can go bishop h5, this is just a dead draw but you need to be very careful. For example, here you cannot take the pawn so you only have pawn to f6. If bishop e7, now your light squared bishop can freely move. If bishop takes, you can take back with your king. By the way, you are going to go back to the g4 square and 
start moving your bishop along this diagonal there is no progress that white can make from here for example point to h5 is a blunder because you simply go back and on the next move you are going to win that pawn so this is just to demonstrate how drawish games of opposite colored bishops can be fact number eight same colored bishops are not always drawish but your king must be in front of your opponent's king that's number one or it must be much closer to the square of promotion than your opponent's king is if black's king was on d5 for example or e6 this could be an easy draw because your opponent's king is also closer to the square of promotion and may sit in front of your pawn on the light square. So now this is clearly winning for white. If only you can find pawn to a4. If bishop e7 check, you still continue marching forward. King e8, bishop f6. Your bishop must be in front of your pawn. If bishop takes f6, black's king will be in opposition and you are assured of winning this end game. For example, king e8, then you go pawn to f6. This is clearly winning because black's king is in opposition. You can head to my website www.casperchess.com and become my partner or simply join through the link in the comment section down below where you can help me to promote my courses and earn some commission. All it takes is just to register for my affiliate program promote our courses and earn some passive income all right you guys thank you for watching my video once again until next time bye bye